Um, in that in that context, what I am going going to be doing is talking talking about fixed income. And the genesis of the presentation was actually through the financial crisis. What we have seen is um, you know fixed incomes come to the fore a little bit. Um, so certainly since March, we've seen we've seen a lot of investors talk, talking to us about fixed income, wanting to know more. I've been invited to join a lot of client um, client presentations, um, both within Anchor and actually external to Anchor. And yeah, my takeaway from that has been that fixed income is not as natural, it's not as comfortable as equity for many, many financial advisors. And that's because equity is, is, is part of the South African culture. We all understand how the stock market works. But as soon as we move into the bond markets, as we move into the income market, what I have felt is that, that our, um, our, our clients are, or advisors are a little bit more uncomfortable with unfamiliar turf, and and as a result, um, you know, it's 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 not as easy. What 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 I'm trying to do today is I want to talk through the fixed income markets. I want to try and make it more intuitive. So I'm going to be talking for about 45 minutes, give or take. And the idea is that at the end of this, you'll have a good handle on what a fixed income manager actually is doing. And I'll try and give you some tips for the client interactions as well. And some of the things that I have found have worked well when we've, when we've done this. So in that context, um, you know, as, as a fixed income manager, I'm going to start with a very, very basics. And let's talk about what a bond is. So a bond actually should be quite, quite intuitive. Basically, um, just a loan. So what I've graphed on this chart for you here is if you want over time, um, how the loan would typically work. So in January 2020, you would lend a client a million rand in each of the, and you'd see a negative amount here because there's a cash outflow. In each of the next years, you'd get your interest income, it gets paid to you. And then at the maturity of the loan, you actually get your original loan back plus interest for the last, for the last year. So it's, it's just really a set cash flow profile. Very important though, is to realize that the loan gets repaid at the end of 2025. So it does have a finite life, your loan gets repaid. That's very important to us when it comes to valuing the loan and, and um, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So that's really what a bond is. What then happened is as these loans developed, um, you know, the, the, the guys in investment banking had the idea of we trade shares, let's start trading loans. But to trade loans, we needed to standardize them. We need to standardize what the, um, what the contracts look like, standardize the formats. So we took all of these, these loans and we turned them into bonds, which is really just a standardized form of, um, of the um, loan. And we started trading them on the exchange. The thing is, as soon as something starts trading, it gets, it gets a price and the price of any asset goes up and down over time for a variety of reasons. So you, you end up with this traded loan um, that now can have a bit of a price variance over time, but you know that at some point, the loan is gonna to get to maturity and it's going to get repaid. So that's, that really is what a fixed income manager is doing, is we're lending out money to, to clients and um, earning interest income within, within a market where there's a bit of a, a price so my challenge as a fixed income manager and that of, of all my competitors is really to add additional value to, um, to, to your portfolio. And there are three fundamental risks that portfolio managers can take. So I don't care if you're talking about me, if you're talking about one of the guys, at, um, one of the other asset managers, or even if you're talking about someone offshore, there really are only three risks that we're taking. First is we can manage the duration risk. So we can push the duration around in the portfolio and that's got certain impacts on your portfolio. The second risk we can take is credit risk, which basically says that you, know, you can lend to weaker people um, who maybe don't have as strong an ability to repay you, but then you can charge them more money. Alternatively, what a lot of asset managers do is they say, right, it's very difficult to add value in fixed income, and it, it is, to be fair, quite, quite difficult. You can see that in the ranking tables where most, most performances cluster around each other. And therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in another asset class to try and add an additional source of alpha to the portfolio. So we'll see that as well, and I'll cover on that. But fundamentally, those are the three sort of levers that portfolio managers, fixed income managers are, are pulling. So as an, as an advisor, 
What you want to understand is how is the interplay between each of those. I'm going to start by talking about, about duration. And <clears throat> in terms of duration, it is not intuitive, immediately intuitive. And I think that's because we package it up in jargon. But what I did is I went on the 22nd of April to First Rand Bank, First National Bank's website, and I downloaded a table that's probably familiar to most of you. It's basically their deposit rates, their fixed deposit rates, and if you deposited money with them for one month, um, First Rand would pay you 3.95%. And at the bottom, if I extended the deposit and I deposited money with um, First Rand for 60 months, the interest rate that first round would pay me increased to 7.85 percent that's effectively um you know basically uh, the list of as, as you term out alone how much more interest income you will earn pushing putting that in a graph um you end up with what bond managers call a yield curve so all i've done is i've taken the information on the left hand side of the screen and i've graphed it um so you can see for one month um you know you're earning just less than four percent and at 60 months it's The idea behind the yield curve is I can now visually, as a portfolio manager in fixed income, decide where I want to, want to position clients. I can see how much extra money I'm being paid, how much extra interest I'm being paid in the um, portfolios by extending the term um, for which I'm prepared to actually make an investment. The longer you're prepared to um, lock up money, the more interest income you earn. The thing with duration is it does have consequences from a risk perspective. So let's talk about those. And I'm going to do that by way of an example. So let's, <clears throat> let's assume the day um, before the COVID crisis that you gave First Round Bank a fixed deposit for five years. You did that at an interest rate of 6.5%. Two days later, the crisis hit, interest rates were going crazy, the financial markets were going crazy, and First Round Bank actually revised their um, deposit rate for five years from 6.5% up to 8%. So if we take that as our example, and let's talk about when you'd be happy and when you'd be sad. If, <clears throat> if you'd locked in the 6.5% interest rate and two days later, the bank was offering 8% rates, you're sad, you've missed out on an opportunity by going in a little bit too early, you missed out on some additional interest income and um, you'd be sad. What does that mean? It means if we were to look at these two deposits and say, I invested at six and a half percent, two days later, I could have invested in eight, that deposit I made at six and a half percent is worth less. Interest rates have gone up and I'm sad. My deposit is now worth less than a 8% deposit would have been. So as interest rates go up, the yield, um, um, <clears throat> you're, you become sad. Unfortunately, interest rates rising makes bond prices go down. Secondly, let's look at the term of the loan. If we'd lend money for five years, I'm locked into this lower interest rate for five years. If I'd only done a three month fixed deposit, I would be far less sad because in three months time, my deposit rolls off and I can then invest at the new higher rate. Because I'm locked in for five years, I'm going to be sad for a longer period of time. The amount of sadness, the value of my loan goes down more, the longer that I've locked in the, um, the loan. Come back to what I was saying about duration earlier. Um, you earn more if you turn the money out, but your, your risk of the price of the bond going down increases. So it's all about managing the amount of time that you're prepared to lend money to a client. And that's what duration really is about. Remember at the beginning, I said that bonds, <clears throat> bonds repay at maturity. So think about the loan where I've loaned money out for five years. And as time goes by, I get closer and closer to the end of that loan, closer and closer to maturity, and then first round is going to give me my money back. The extent to which I'm sad becomes less and less because as I get closer and closer to maturity, my money is going to come back, I can roll into new markets. So that's what we call mean reversion. The, um, you know, over time, the bond, the loan's value starts to recover because you get to the maturity, you get your money back and you can reinvest in, in um, more suitable um, interest rates or the market prevalent interest rates at that point in time. So that's actually a lot of what fixed income managers think about every day is how much interest income can I, um, can I earn on my portfolio? How long am I looking, locking in the money? If it goes, um, if interest rates go up, how, how, 
how detrimental is it to the portfolio, and how long does it take the portfolio to recover? Finally, we also do need to think about credit risk. The truth is, I think First Round Bank is a rock solid credit. So from that perspective, we're, we're indifferent as to whether we lent the money before or after COVID. And the other point to make is that a lot of fixed income managers will invest in what we call floating rate bonds. So the idea of a floating rate bond is that we would lend money um, in a bond where First Round doesn't pay us a fixed interest amount of 6.5% every year, but rather the interest rate changes as market rates go up. So for a, <clears throat> for a period, the interest rates might've gone up, the SA Reserve Bank cuts interest rates, floating, floating rates go down again, and the bond effectively pays, um, plays a rate um, similar to, um, to Jibar to, um, to Prime minus a little bit. Um, those bonds um, effectively um, reprice very quickly and have far, far less in, um, interest impact. Don't, don't want to get too sucked into those and, and rather just talk the principles of the yields on bonds. What I find works very well in explaining this, and I actually use this a lot with clients when I, when I chat to them, is, is the chart that says, well, fixed income managers tend to group their, their duration selections into different styles. So typically what you will find is a, in running up here, I've lost my mouse, um, you will find a money market fund is able to invest money with clients for up to six months on average, 12 months at the maximum. So it's a very, very short duration, 0.5 years at max. As a result, you get incredible stability of the performance of that portfolio, but the interest rate is quite low. It's probably going to return somewhere between four and 5% in today's markets. Investment managers, portfolio managers then say, well, I'm lending money out on average for six months. What if I turn that out to about a year, a year to a year and a half? We do that and you end up in what we call a core income fund or a Java plus fund or a stable income fund. And basically because we're lending money for a longer period of time, the interest rate that we can earn goes up quite, quite nicely. And now we can earn about 5.7% for our clients. But if you look at the chart here, you can see that there's a, the thick blue line starts to get a bit of a wave pattern. So you start to get a bit of volatility of returns coming through because you term out the money. I'm now going to chat um, the flexible income fund. So what we do is we say, let's take the loan to our, um, to our clients uh, or to, our, um, to, to the issuers. We're lending it for about a year and a half. Let's turn that out to about three years to five years. So we just extend the term, we extend the duration of the loans a little bit further. And that's typically what your flexible incomes, your strat incomes, et cetera, will be doing. And you will find that your expected return over time um, increases. So you expect over time to average 6.5% return, but the actual return, which is the thick, um, which is the solid blue line, gets a definite wave pattern as the market in, um, sort of moves, moves around its um, you know, market cycle. Finally, if we push it to its maximum conclusion, what you get is the bond funds. We say we're lending money in the flexible income for you know, five year periods. Let's push that to 30 year periods and see what happens. Again, we can, we'll immediately see that the expected income of a, um, of a bond fund is a lot higher. We're locking the money up for a lot longer. You expect to get a higher interest rate, but because the duration has now increased, you start to see quite wild swings in the returns of a bond fund. So you could have a year with a 20% return. You could have a year with a negative return. But what you do know in fixed income, remember that mean reversion I was talking about earlier, is these things tend to average themselves out. And for a bond fund, if you are able to hold the fund for a sufficient period of time, it's going to average itself out around about a 9.5% um, return for investors at the moment. So that starts to speak about um, duration. It speaks about how how different portfolios are going to behave, the risk you're taking. I'll come back to this chart in a few minutes. I'm going to end off with this chart and another chart. Let's pull duration together. And what I've got here is a chart which I created, which shows you a sort of bar of duration risk. Gold, blue is very low duration. Red hot risk is very high duration. And I've pretty much put on the chart here the different portfolios that are generally available for, for IFAs. And you can see sort of where, where, they would, where, they would, um, where they would come out. So cash is your lowest duration. If you've got money in a bank account, your duration is one year. 
and money markets is a little bit higher, your JIBOB um, cash plus core income portfolios pushes to a little bit higher. Anchor flexible income, and I stick the word anchor there because flexible income funds do very slightly, is a is touch higher, and then you get into your short-term one to three-year bond funds and your long duration bond funds. We need a specialist portfolio to really get um, into the high risk. In terms of duration, there's some useful things to understand as an advisor. And the first important thing to understand is that, you know, I often get asked by advisors, what is your portfolio's duration? I'll go one year and the advisor will go, absolutely great, fantastic, thanks for the answer. But what does one year duration actually mean? And basically it's got a very useful mathematical property. If your duration is one year, what it is saying is that for each 1% rise in interest rates, the portfolio's market value should decline by about 1%. If your duration is two years, a 1% rise in inflation of interest rates will see the portfolio value decline by about 2%. So <clears throat> the duration is a, is a measure of how long the bond is going to be outstanding, but at the same time, it is a very useful gauge of the interest rate risk that you are, you are running because it's, it's got a direct relationship with the market um, change value changes that you would see should interest rates rise or, or decline. The next aspect of duration for financial advisors is to understand that duration does not diversify away. So if you go and buy the coronation fund and the prescient fund and the anchor fund, we've all got durations of about one, um, you're not going to diversify the duration. Your average duration, um, if you want, is, is, is one year on the portfolio. We're all invested in the same markets. So what you will expect is that the duration across everything behaves exactly the same way. You're not going to get a different duration exposure from a different manager and that the entire portfolio as a whole of, um, will, will behave almost like one across, <clears throat> across that investment collection. The other very important aspect of durations, everyone gets very worked up about duration because, um, you know, because it, it is a measure of short term volatility. But remember, go back to what we said at the beginning. If you hold a bond to maturity, duration risk can never result in a permanent loss of capital because your money is going to be paid, paid back. So you might have invested under duration and locked in your 6.5% yield. You might be a bit grumpy because two days later, your friend down the road got 8% yield. But at the end of the day, duration, um, you know, you're, you're going to earn a little bit less over time. Your income might be a bit lower but you're never going to lose money on duration. You're going to get repaid your bond and you're going to get um, your full amount of capital back. So that's, um, that's also very important to understand on duration. And in fact, if you've got the um, strength of, of, of comfort of risk appetite, and if you've got the financial ability to hold a bond to maturity, you're going to get your money back and um, you know, duration won't hurt you. Switching tact, I said that uh, financial advisors need to look at credit risks, or sorry, asset managers look at credit risks. And the credit risk is, is actually um, the risk of lending money to somebody and they can't pay you back. They go, they go bankrupt and they can't repay you. Credit risk, um, <clears throat> again, you get different grades of credit risk. We, we've, um, we've scaled them here. Sort of ice blue is theoretically, if you read textbooks, the government is the lowest credit risk in any country. The major banks are lower credit risk, your investment grade corporates, and then you start getting into the, the spicy stuff, um, high yield corporates, distressed corporates, where, where credit risk is not high. Obviously, the weaker someone is financially, the more unlikely they are to be able to repay you, the higher the interest rate that you can charge, the more income that your portfolio manager is able to gather for you. So if, if, we, if, we, if we look at South, South African fixed, in, um, fixed income, your credit risk is not always apparent because what happens is your credit risk means that you're, you know, if someone is pushing the boat out and he's lending money only to, um, to Eskom and Land Bank, for example, his portfolio interest income is going to be very high. And for a long period of time, that portfolio is going to show a very, very high return. However, when credit risk bites, it creates a bit of a sawtooth function for the portfolio. So suddenly there's a sort of step down and then you'll, you'll start earning higher interest income again and it steps down every time somebody goes bankrupt. Um, we've, we've seen that of, of, of late in South Africa a few times and I'll talk about those in a minute. In terms of credit risk, what you really want to understand as a portfolio, um, as, as an IFA, as an advisor, 
is where the portfolio credit risk is being targeted. In other words, at what cutoff level does the portfolio stop investing? You know, is, is it investing just in the major banks? Is it pushing to investment grade? Are they putting high yield? Um, are they putting high yield corporates into the portfolio? Because this is, um, you know, the, the key risk. Very important: the difference between duration and credit. Duration can never give you a permanent loss of capital. Credit does give you a permanent loss of capital. If somebody is bankrupt and they cannot repay you, unfortunately, you lose your money. We've seen that in South Africa with African Bank. We've seen that with with Land Bank. We've seen that with First Trust, um, etc. So how should we think about credit? Unlike um, duration, though, diversification is a massive be uh, benefit. So what you want to do is look for um, portfolio managers that have highly diversified port credit portfolios. I don't care how deep the fundamental analysis is that you see. And we saw it in South Africa with, with Steinhoff, where you know, <clears throat> portfolio managers are, and specialists can really look at Steinhoff in extreme detail. But at the end of the day, there were things that sometimes jump out of nowhere and catch, catch you off guard, and diversification is your only defense. So concentrated portfolios are a big, big red flag for, for financial advisors. Look at diversification. How many names are in the portfolio? What's the largest names? How is that portfolio spread? Unfortunately, academic research says that to get proper diversification in a fixed income portfolio, you need to invest in 400 different um, companies. Um, in South Africa, there are less than 400 listed companies on the stock exchange, and there are maybe 80 companies that issue bonds. So we really battle for diversification. We've got to accept that our, our, our diversification is more difficult in South Africa. However, to the extent um, a portfolio manager is able to spread it out, it brings massive benefits to your clients. The other, other thing on credit risk is to understand the role of rating agencies. So rating agencies go, go and look at a company and they assess whether or not a company or country will be able to repay its loan. They look at the strength of balance sheet, the quality of management, the business model, et cetera, and they form a view on, on that company. Rating agencies can often are wrong. I've seen AAA rated companies go bank, or countries go bankrupt. I've seen C rated um, com companies repay their loans. So they, the, it's not a crystal ball that predicts what's going to go, go um, happen in future. And rather the rating agency just assesses the probability of default. How likely is someone to be able to repay their loan? Very importantly, <clears throat> the rating agency scales differ. So, and what they look at differs. So if you look at Moody's, their models differ tremendously from Standard & Poor's and from GCR. So it becomes very, very dangerous to start comparing across different rating agencies because a triple B at Moody's is not the same as a triple B at, um, at um, Standard & Poor's, for example. And, it's to, and um, as a result, it makes, makes credit risk a little bit more opaque. So just be careful of that. What I do want to talk about is, as I sit here as a portfolio manager and I see some interesting marketing comments and marketing um, blurb that, that guys put into, into their funds. I just want to chat about some amber, amber flags, some red flags that, um, that you need to, need to be aware of. The first is a lot of people will talk about their portfolio's average credit risk. The average credit risk of the portfolio is, um, is whatever, triple B. Um, the average credit risk is absolutely irrelevant, and it's very important to understand that. It is not your average company that defaults and costs you money. It is the weakest company. So if you had 10 years ago invested in a portfolio that was pure US government AAA rated bonds, and um, it had 10% um, African bank, you still lost money on credit even though that portfolio, because of the large weighting of, of high quality um, um, investments, would have probably averaged a double A rating. Um, the average was irrelevant. It was the weakest name in that collection that, that actually resulted in a loss. So from that perspective, don't, um, you know, I, I give very little credence to average credit risks. And the important question to ask is, who is the weakest name in your portfolio? Who worries you the most? What is their, what is their rating? how far um, down the credit quality will you, will you move?
The next comment I see quite often from um, on fact sheets, and some guys actually stamp it on the top of their fact sheet, is that it's all investment grade. The portfolio is rated double A. Um, so the interesting thought is that all of the rating agencies, Moody's, S&P, Fitch, um, have downgraded South Africa to double B or, or weaker than investment grade. So what that effectively means is that on an international scale rating, nothing is investment grade. We just aren't an investment grade country. Okay, so, so how do we get to an investment grade rating? So what, what the rating agencies will do is they'll create a national scale rating, which basically says we're going to take the real rating of these companies and we're just going to uplift it. So we're going to sort of enhance the companies um, and the issuer's credit rating um, to say that if South Africa was AAA, where would, this, where would this rank relative to South Africa? So it's a little bit like saying, well, if South Africa's economy was pumping, South Africa was flying, and we didn't have any sovereign concerns, and you know, everything was functioning smoothly, where would this company be rated? Yes, it would be investment grade, but the, guys, that's, that's not the reality. The reality is that um, nothing in South Africa is really investment grade. I think that's been made very clear following the downgrades in March. However, um, you know, because, because of some of the quirks of the system, there's a bit of a leeway where we can, we can kind of position portfolios um, to look a bit stronger than they, than they really are. So just be aware of that as well. It's, it's more, you know, and the rating scales are different anyway, so it doesn't really matter. It's more about understanding who the weaker names are in the portfolio. The other one that I love, by the way, is, and I've seen at least two people do this, they'll market themselves as our portfolio only invests in banks. It's rock solid, it only invests in banks. And, um, you know, that makes it strong from a creative perspective. Um, let's be honest with ourselves. The last two defaults in South Africa were land bank. And before that, we had African bank. So from that perspective, both, um, you know, both of the re most recent defaults were banks. The fact that it's all with banks and it is a regulated bank doesn't change the fact that things can go wrong, that there is credit risk, and we need to be aware of that. I think the big four banks, the big five banks, I'm throwing very sick into that as well, actually, are, are, are very solid. I think if you're only investing in those, it's great. But a lot of guys will tell you it's all with banks, and then they'll put it in subordinated banks' um, paper. They'll put it into you know, your, your, your second tier banks, I'm not going to name all the banks. And as a result, you end up with a portfolio that's, um, you know, it's all with banks, but it's actually with pretty, pretty weak issuers. So just be aware of that as well as an advisor. Those, that's something that I do see in the market. But, um, you know, fundamentally from credit risk, it's all about understanding, um, you know, the, the, the extent to which your portfolio manager is going to go down the curve and understanding that obviously as you do push credit risk out, you earn more. But when it goes wrong, your step functions are going to be a little bit more drastic. So finally, as a portfolio manager, I sit there and I've, I've, I can manage the portfolio's duration. I can manage credit risk, but um, it gets a little bit difficult to add, <clears throat> to add alpha. So what, what we will then do as portfolio managers, we'll try and bring in another source of alpha. At Anchor, what we do is we invest in global bonds. So we'll invest in bonds issued in Europe, we'll invest in bonds for a portion of the portfolio and that brings in a bit of diversification it's we do that from a credit risk diversification perspective but it also um, you know i've worked on wall street for for a number of years it brings it sort of ties in the skills to <clears throat> um, to bring in an alternate source of alpha for the portfolio um, another very well-known um, brand name portfolio manager um, trades currencies and brings in currency risk and trades the rand um, via of our options um, a third well-known um, portfolio manager actually invests heavily in listed property, brings most of the alpha from listed property. Um, it's had a bit of a rough run of late, to be fair, and um, brings, you know, mingles that with their portfolio um, or with their fixed income to bring it uplift. We also see portfolios with preference shares. Um, some guys put a bit of equity risk in there. Some guys bring in inflation-linked bonds. The idea is that as a financial advisor, what you understand, you understand the first two things I've spoken about, but then you also want to understand the purpose um, or, or sorry, how the portfolio manager is bringing in that extra alpha. What other asset classes are they specialists in 
to create extra value for your for your for your for your clients and it's about diversifying alpha sources as much as possible so you know anchor global bonds will map, will actually blend very very well with um with the guys investing in listed property or the guys investing in currency risk because we bring a third aspect um, to a combination of all three, um, we bring a third source of alpha. So when the other two are under pressure, we kind of hold the portfolio up, and at times global bonds might lag a bit, and they'll you know they'll hold us up. It's it's very useful to blend portfolio managers from that perspective. Um, if you're not blending, um, and I'm not I'm, I'm not saying you have to blend, then identifying and understanding the particular source of alpha is very important because you need to communicate that to your clients. You need to make sure that the client is comfortable with um, with the risks they're taking. So that, in a nutshell, sort of concludes the section on what what we invest in, how we um, how how we um, as portfolio managers manage things. Um, it concludes the section on what to look for look at um, for um, for in portfolio managers. You know, understand what a portfolio's alpha, um, duration is. Understand how duration will behave. Um, the advantage to duration, the volatility it'll bring to your portfolio, understand credit risk that the portfolio is investing in, and then finally understand where else your portfolio manager might might be looking to create alpha. That's that's those are sort of the key things that you would be looking for in a in a um, fixed income portfolio manager. Switching across, then <clears throat> let's just think about duration and your savings one one last time as we start to. Um, so I've um, totally, totally lost access to my to, um, clock up here. Yeah, I'm um, having run, run for a bit of a while. But, um, so interest rates have been cut by 2.75% in um, 2020. Imagine an example where IFA number one invested 10 million Rand for a retired fund in a bond fund, a high duration fund at 9%. Let's say he invested that in September last year. IFA two took that same retirement, um, same retired client, and put 10 million rand into a flexible income fund. It was yielding 8%. Flexible income funds are far more defensive, as we know, they don't have the volatility. Let's talk about the client reviews. <coughs> and I'm going to talk about two client reviews and what's happened to those clients. Um, and let's talk at the 31st of March, so at the height of the COVID crisis. And then let's talk at um, at today. Actually, is is a good day. <clears throat> if you invested in the bonds at 9%, what happened to the COVID crisis is your bond funds lost about, <coughs> excuse me, is lost about 15% of their value. So IFA number one had a meeting with his client on the 31st of March, and the discussion would have been something along the lines of, look, it's not great. We're at the height of a crisis. Your portfolio value has declined from 10% or 10 million to 8.5 million. We're down 15%. Um, I watched that I, um, that presentation, that webinar from Nolan. I know that the bond fund invests in duration. Duration is mean reverting. It will come back over time. Um, so let's just be patient with this. But in the interim, you've earned your 9% 9, 9 um, income. So he has 900,000. Thank you very much. IFA 2 would have had a much easier discussion on the 31st of March, which is you invested 10 million. Your 10 million is now worth 9.9 .9 million. We're going through a rough patch in the markets, but your portfolio has been very defensive. So that's good news. And you have your 800,000 Rand um, income for the year. So both of those um, you know, discussions, obviously the bond discussion would have been a little bit trickier at 31 March. Roll that discussion to, um, to today, and let's pretend we're having that IFA meeting today. Um, today, what you're going to say to the, um, the client that invested in the bond fund was that you invested 10 million Rand in the bond fund. It, um, you know, it's returned um, 9%, so you has your 900,000 Rand um, return, and bonds have largely recovered. Thank you very much, we'll see you next year. IFA two now has a problem. Because he's going to be saying, we invested 10 million Rand, it earned you 800,000, there it is. It's been very defensive, but interest rates in South Africa have come down by 2.75%. So your portfolio yield is no longer 8%, it's probably about 6%. Um, dear client, I need you to please reduce your lifestyle and I need you to start living on 600,000 Rand a year because um, we can't generate the income we previously could. 
So what happens is by locking in the duration, IFA number one has had a more volatile experience, but he's locked in the client's income for nine, for, um, in the bond fund it would be for about 10 years. IFA number two has got great capital protection, but the client's income is going to be subject to interest rates in South Africa. And if interest rates get cut again this week, that IFA number two is in the flexible income fund is going to have another difficult discussion with the client to say, we need to cut your expenses every, um, even further. We can't generate the income that we previously could on your, on your, on your savings. So that's, that's got a <clears throat> massive, massive profound effect for how we allocate clients. And what we need to, what we need to think about is I've taken a very extreme example here is it's about getting that right combination of duration of bonds um, and income preservation over time, um, coupled with capital preservation and mark to market risk um, to, to get the right sort of blend for clients. So typically what I find is the right combination is somewhere between in today's market, a 10% to a 25% bond allocation and 75% into more of a flexible income allocation. Um, and that just gives a little bit more defensiveness to your, to your clients um, income over time but it does come at the cost of potentially more volatile um, periods. So I'm going to ha hustle along here a bit because I did lose time as I, um, as I had to run upstairs with my interview now. Um, let's talk about the discussion with IFA clients and what I find works. The first line and I said I'd come back to this, <coughs> that works very well is to actually graphically show the client his, his risk. If you're investing in a flexible income fund, the dotted line shows your expected return over time. The red line shows, oh sorry, the blue line shows that the likely actual and there will be deviations from expected. So you might be expecting 6.4% return over time. Understand that because we've, we've gone into um, longer term products because the loans out here are out to about five years, the portfolio yield is pushed up but there might be periods where you earn only 5%. There might be periods where you earn 8%. We need to expect that you're going to average 6.4 in this market. And that the understanding that is very important. It's very important that the client understands this in advance because I find, you know, when, when you get to the client in a year's time, and if you have ended up, unfortunately, at a lower point on the curve through the cycle, you can explain to the client what's happening. You can explain that um, you're still expecting 6.4%. It happens to have gone down, but it is, you know, it is a product that will have a bit of a cyclical return uh, profile. Similarly, in bonds, you can have that discussion. It's obviously a slightly more animated discussion. I've talked to you through the slide before, but I find this works incredibly well when we're chatting to clients. The second, the second slide that I find works particularly well when I chat to clients is to actually show them almost the menu of fixed income and what it really is. So I've listed, um, listed the sort of key categories or types of fund. I've listed the anchor equivalent and the expected yield in this type of environment. As a risk measure for clients, it's often useful to say, how often will this portfolio report a loss? And your core income funds about once every five years, your flexible income funds about once every two years, and a bond fund up to once every three months. It's not the end of the world if we have a loss once every five years, because we know on average, we're still going to get close to our 5.7% return. Um, and that's a good outcome for clients. So it, it gives a good sense of um, and a good ability as a, an advisor then to start to discuss, look, if we want to push into higher yield, we obviously want to earn more interest income. We've got to accept that our market volatility is going to be higher. I have seen a lot of clients gravitate towards the higher income right now. I think people are, are battling, you know, if you were living on a 32 day call account in January, your income is basically 40% lower today. And in order to defend that, clients are being forced to risk up. They are moving towards the higher risk end of the spectrum. Um, we've got to, got to be sensitive to that. Um, we've got to understand what the risks are. We also are seeing clients that are moving um, out of equities. They're going, look, SA equities has just been a, been a sad ride. Um, so I'm just looking to move out of SA equities for a period and I'm moving to, looking to move into income. That client's already got a high risk appetite. So actually the bond fund probably is a good spot for him. It's going to be volatile. I've shown you all the graphs, understand that in advance, that makes sense. The other thing I'd say openly is our asset allocation, 100% bond allocation is, is stupid. Nobody should do that. You should have equity exposure um, in, in your portfolio. 
Um, so from that perspective, I find, you know, honing into the discussion of constructing the right portfolio in advance and then reviewing that later, particularly with those drives of volatility, tends to work particularly well um, for, for clients. That's, that's, that's the sort of fixed income discussion that I've been gravitating towards. It's the discussion I've been having when, when advisors are asked to join. Um, typically, I get asked to join when it's, when it's going to be a difficult discussion. That this is a very, very useful means of just, you know, softening the discussion and, and having an easier discussion. Um, I very purposefully today, again, yeah, my background has not changed, um, have not gone into our outlook for bonds. Um, there may be a few questions on that, Dale will ask me in a few minutes. Um, but I just wanted to give you some, some thoughts as a, as a portfolio manager as to what should matter for, for, um, for the IFAs. Dale, over to you for any questions. Thank you, everybody. And first, apologies for any sound issues that we may have had. Um, Cape Town's connectivity doesn't seem great at the, at the moment. Um, but certainly, we will send the presentation out to you during uh, the course of this week. And um, we have a great deal of questions. So also feel free to type in additional questions now if you want to. And Nolan, I'm going to try group the questions together, if I may, just in the, in the interest of time. We've had a lot of questions around duration. So if you wouldn't mind covering, the people would like to understand exactly what you mean by modified duration. What is the average duration within your portfolios and how do you determine that? And on the graph that you showed, you showed a time scale being one, 1 1.5. Is that referring to months? So does 1.5 mean 18 months or how is duration measured? Okay, sure. Sorry, I was um, a lot of things as I was running running around trying to deal with my um, Wi-Fi issues there. Um, so duration by convention is measured in years, and that means if I talk about a duration of one, it's one year. If I talk about a duration of one point five, that is eighteen um, eighteen months. And I think that's just a convention that's 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 arisen over time but it it, it is a measure of a, how long a period of time is um, and we speak about it in years in terms of um, the question what is modified duration um, so duration uh, it starts to get a bit technical but duration is basically the amount average amount of time it's going to take a loan to repay me so if I have a loan of five years and let's pretend interest rolls up repaid at maturity, that's got a five-year duration. Um, if interest rates get pay, interest gets paid along the way, it, the duration is a bit less because each, the average amount of time is brought down by the small amounts of interest payments over time. Um, duration, we, we then go and we value those, um, those interest payments and calculate the weighted average time that a present valued um, payment takes place rather than the full payment that becomes the modified duration. So the modified duration is a little bit lower um, as, um, than, than a full duration. It gets very technical. Um, it gives, you know, it's, it's, it's why we've got guys with master's degrees in mathematics working in our fixed income team. Um, it gives, you know, it gives, gives, gives them something to really focus on. Um, the long and the short from an IFA perspective is it doesn't really matter. It's going to be close enough for your purposes whether you talk modified duration or just normal um, duration or um, some of the others. Um, and um, what you watch, you know, so, so don't, don't get too hung up on that. Um, if you want, I can work you through the math on the difference or I can get our quant, quant to find someone as well. Right. Um, I'm going to try to group the next group of questions together. We do have a great deal of questions. If I don't get your question, I, we will come back to you uh, during email. I have a huge amount to get through here. So we, the next question uh, is around the sovereign debt crisis at Nese and how would this affect duration? Would you also then discuss the default risk and how and what the optimum duration would be for SA? Um, and in the event of a government default, how will the different bonds duration-wise react? Wow. Okay, there's a lot of questions in there. So, so let's let's kick it off with South Africa. And South Africa is at a crossroads. There's no no debating it. Financially, the government is is in a is in trouble. It's in the spot of other. Um, I think it it plays out one of one of three ways. 
The route that I think is most likely is that Tito will actually deliver his cost savings that we need um, in the October M um, MTBS. I think that's reasonably likely to happen. That'll be good. Um, at the same time, um, I think we, you know, we as a country need to get some growth initiatives on, on the ground going. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's maybe early days. I like to be an optimist. I do think that if I look at where we were two years ago, three years ago, we were just totally doing the wrong things. We started doing the right things. We just need to do this. I'm, I'm probably uh, an optimist, maybe a 50% optimist. I think if the wheels come off and we can't turn the ship around in time, there's probably a 30% chance that we go to the IMF and we'll get an IMF bailout. And at the same time, the IMF will assist with um, policies in South Africa. That's a good thing. Um, you know, what, what, what is that really saying? It's saying that because we haven't been able to um, implement the policies we need for recovery, um, we're going to get another, um, you know, we're going to get external advice, external help that'll um, enable us to put in place the policies we actually, you know, would, would like to see anyway. So I'm not convinced the IMF is a dreadful outcome for a longer period. In the shorter period, politicians are going to hate it because government employment will have to go down, um, corruption will kind of come down, um, those sorts of things. So it's, it, it's, it's a bit of a political um, bit of pull to swallow, but for as a country as a whole, it's probably not the worst outcome ever. Um, the other possibility, and I ascribe you know, maybe a 20% possibility to it, is that the government decides, look, the, you know, the bitter pull from the IMF is, is too bitter. We're not going to go down that route, and we're going to go down the populist route, um, which ends up as a Zimbabwe scenario. And that's, that's something, you know, we can't discount it. We can't take it off the table. But I think it's the least likely of the three scenarios um, certainly, if I look at government's um, communications, if I look at um, you know what's taking place right now, um, they're almost pu pulling away from that um, likelihood, and I think the other um, the probability of that is decreasing. Um, but we've got to we've got to keep an eye out on that. Um, what is the optimal duration in in South Africa? That comes down to what your outlook is. For, um, for, for bonds and it comes down to your risk appetite as well and it comes down to your income needs. So it's, it's a bit of a tricky one. Um, if you said to me a blank piece of paper, where would I invest? I'm, you know, our portfolios are very heavily invested into South African seven-year bonds and South African 10-year bonds. Um, duration um, on that in the bond fund sort of averages about six years. Um, we've got a smaller helping of that in, um, in the, in the flexible income funds, the duration is about one year. I think that duration, that duration is particularly attractive. I think your fixed rate bonds are paying a lot higher um, in income relative to where they were before the COVID crisis. So I would absolutely expect that if you looked across the board, you should see durations have increased by about 25% to 50%. Um, from where they were um, pre-crisis. I think that's the sensible thing for portfolio managers to be doing. All right, another quick one. Um, uh, we were asked with interest rates having coming come down in SA and funds already having bonds exposure, does that mean that a client entering the fund now is then buying bonds at a higher price, which may then decrease if yields increase? Um, yes. The... Um, you know, if you are buying um, shorter dated bonds, your, your three-year bonds, your seven-year bonds, et cetera, yields are lower and the bond prices by definition therefore are higher. Um, so you do, you know, the impacts is that you are locking in a yield on, uh, you know, the government six-year bond right now, you're locking in a yield of 7.4%. And if interest rates go up, um, yeah, your bond price will go down. If interest rates come down further, which, which I suspect they will, your, um, your bond price goes up a little bit. Um, but you are, if you're buying, you're locking into the market right now, yes. Nolan, part bonds offer significantly better yields than typical income funds. Is the associated credit risk linked to property-backed financing worth the additional yield? So which bonds? Part bonds. Part bonds, okay. Let's, let's familiar with those to be fair. Um, I am 
cautious on listed property at the moment. Um, I think that there is a lot, a lot of risk in it, and the risk comes from almost legal risk, where what has happened is through the COVID crisis, um, shopping centers have emptied, um, and that's going to translate into rental income coming under pressure. Your, your, your major retailers are going to be trying to negotiate lower rentals as well, and I think that the, you know, they, they're going to be in a position to do that. As your rentals come down, the way you value a property is basically based on market, um, is, is a cap rate. So you say, you know, take rental yield times a multiplier. That's, you know, in a nutshell, the value of the property. That income component has come down. So we, as a result, the, the property will generate less income for the foreseeable future. Its value has gone down. And I think we saw Growth Point make, uh, make that clear in their recent announcements. Consequence of that is that the, um, a lot of the property companies have loan to value covenants in their loans. So they say you've got a loan of, um, you know, 5 million Rand, but you must maintain the value of your properties must be above 10 million Rand. As the value of the property comes down, these loan to value covenants are likely to be breached in places. We don't totally know where it's very, very difficult right now to assess. We can, there, some property companies clearly are going to be fine. Others, it's going to be touch and go. We're worried about that. So right now, we are underweight property. Um, though increasingly, I'm seeing good news. I'm seeing good trends. I'm seeing the properties, um, you know, the messaging coming out of property looking better. But I'm, from our perspective, it's not worth the risk right now of lending money to properties. And we'd rather get over this hump, which is probably 20, um, 12 months from now. Uh, fine. Uh, I see we, we've just about out of time. I'm going to try combine two questions. Um, just your view on inflation linked bonds, whether you see more value in them currently. And last question, do you consider ESG in matters of credit, credit analysis and credit risk? Okay, two, two vastly different questions. Um, ESG, every, everybody that we invest in goes through a credit process. It's about an hour long credit meeting. There's a 30 page document on the back of that that looks at the different components of um, and um, credit risks within the company. As part of our credit process, there is an ESG scorecard. We apply the ESG evaluation across um, environmental, social and governance issues. Um, and we, we consider it in that context. Um, so it forms part of our general credit assessment. Um, usually it, it slightly increases or decreases our credit assessment. We have had one instance where the ESG was just so bad that we actually just couldn't get ourselves to lend money to this particular issuer. Um, so so that's, that's that one. Um, Don, do you want to repeat the other question? Sorry. Yes, whether you're seeing value in currently in inflation-linked bonds. Inflation-linked bonds um, are difficult. Inflation-linked bonds, for technical reasons, offer lower yield in South Africa. So if you're investing in fixed-rate bonds, you are going to earn more. It's just the way the SA market works. Um, <clears throat> so you've got to accept that. That being said, at the moment, um, we have actually increased inflation-linked bond exposures in our, in our portfolios. And partly the reason for that is that cash returns are so low that I'd rather own an inflation-linked bond than cash. So we, um, we do do that. And the other reason is that inflation-linked bonds do give you a little bit of an insurance policy. So if South Africa, that 20% possibility I spoke about of the wrong things happening, if we don't do go, to go down the populist route, um, we bonds because I'll give you protection from um, from bad outcomes because the government can't inflate away an inflationary bond. The higher it pushes inflation, the more it has to pay you. So from that perspective, inflationary bonds do have characteristics that make them a bit more defensive as well. We like them from that perspective. Our holding is still quite small. I um, you know I battle to get excited about them, but we have gradually been increasing the um, the exposure to inflationary bonds. Thank you, everybody. Um, that concludes today's session. Um, we look forward to hopefully seeing you at the next session. We also encourage you that if you have a particular topic you would like us to cover um, in one of these financial training sessions, please feel free to email me. My email is dfranklin at anchorfs.coza. Otherwise, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much.